We've had a discussion uh, in this series uh, with the pediatric oncologists and their uh, increasing concern about long-term effects of something which looks so dramatically wonderful when you had a child with leukemia who now is cognitively disadvantaged, uh, fertility disadvantaged, uh, depressed and a lot of other things that seem to come on 10, 15, 20 years later uh, after their malignancy has been, quote, cured. You guys have been in this now a long time, so you've got a lot of long-term survivors. What are, they, what are the problems, other than what we've just talked about, some of the chronic graft versus host disease, uh, are there problems uh, of cognition, of psychology, of cardiovascular disease uh, because of the Mm -hmm. uh, therapies, are they uh, in any way related to your early type therapies, which were probably a bit more toxic, quite a bit more toxic than uh, what you're dealing with now? Uh, last part of that question is a lot of interest in umbilical cells, which are immunologically so much more tolerant. Uh, do we have enough information 10, 15 years down the line of umbilical uh, transplants in terms of these long-term uh, problems or non? Right, and I think that you can kind of separate the answers to your several questions there by kind of saying, what's the type of transplant? Going back to the menu. All right, this is an auto transplant, so we know we won't have GBH-related issues. We know the immune repertoire will recover and infections after the first several months is going to, are going to be modest. So in that course, it's really tr um, related to the underlying disease, whether it is a predisposition for uh, MDS or whatnot from their prior therapies or the therapy that you used. But by and large, aside from the issue of relapse, those autotransplants are really doing very well. And so we've got a lot of more than several decades worth of data on in the allograph setting, it's again the, the degree of matchedness uh, in a, um, um, a sibling or unrelated donor that's key. But you, you touch on the issue of the umbilical cord, and I think that's where we're really having some keen interest. Because if we can go ahead and get that cord blood in in a normal sized adult uh, and have less graft versus host disease, even though it's not a perfectly matched cord, I mean, that's the best of all worlds. We may retain an anti-leukemic effect and avoid some of the issues of graft versus host disease. So I think that the future, as I said, we're kind of reinventing ourselves. And, and, and that's really good in medicine. You take new technologies, new opportunities, and then uh, can do the particular phase twos and the pivotal threes that are necessary to answer your question with evidence. Well, the last comment, as long as we were on the umbilical, is that uh, there a variety of non-malignant diseases um, in children that bone marrow transplantation has certainly been mm -hmm. considered and uh, one of the problems as I understand uh, with using umbilical cells is getting enough stem cells sure. for an adult. That's much less of a problem with a child so the, 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 the thought now that a lot more sickle patients is an example who let's say have uh, Doppler studies of demonstrate they're going to really have real trouble with neurologic damage down the line, uh, might well do well to, to have a bone marrow transplant, or not a poetic yeah. stem cell transplantation, but in this case specifically from umbilical cells uh, because they're small and let's do it early. What's the, uh, uh, what's the, acute, tech, what's the acute death rate in children, non-malignant, that you're aware of, and forget the thalassemics, we have a lot of problems, but let's say the few that have been done in sickle disease uh, who have had umbilical uh, cord transplants. I asked a question specifically toward should pediatricians really be thinking about this in something like sickle disease quite early in life? I, again, it's the intensity of the preparative conditioning regimen. And if you can have a non-ablative or reduced intensity regimen, get an umbilical cord to a graft. That's the best of all worlds. You won't have to worry about the issues. What of kind of percentage are we talking about in terms of acute uh, death rate in that kind of situation? Oh, I would think that that's in the order of less than 5%. Okay. I mean, it way less than 5% for children. So the risk benefit of giving a child an umbilical, a sickler uh, umbilical cord yeah. blood without enormous ablation yeah. uh, 
really is pretty pretty, pretty at, small. At the worst, if they reject their umbilical cord, they'll go back to their yes. uh, to their uh, sickle state. So it gets down again to the assessment of who, for instance, again in sickle disease, or we've heard about congenital neutropenia and, and so on, who is most likely in the next five years to get in the difficulty and being able to assess that five years before and doing something with a less than 5% risk of death in terms yeah. of the procedure. Yeah. Well, Keith, as always, it's yeah. been a delight to, to talk to you and also to thank you so much for your wonderful uh, help as our section editor in bone marrow transplant, uh, transplantation and look forward to many more years of, of that kind of assistance. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you for watching this video from Hemonc Today. Keep up with all our new videos by visiting the Hemonc Today YouTube channel or go to our website at hemonctoday.com.